Hello and welcome to a discussion about the FLARE network. This presentation will be given in multiple sections and you're welcome to watch each video in sequence. Section one, technical overview. Vicarious calibration today has room for improvement. Flare is a new tool in the toolkit, not meant to displace vicarious calibration as it's done today, but meant to augment and provide another means and method of traceability for absolute vicarious calibration. We believe that sensor calibration is fundamental to the future of data and image quality. Right now, uh, bad or limited or no calibration really makes the data available through satellite, airborne, and geosynchronous imagery less valuable than they could be. Better calibration at a pixel level really provides the ability to drill in to maximize the amount of data that can be extracted by humans, machine learning, or artificial intelligence. But calibration is today as it stands. The methods are, are well understood, but they're difficult. It does require a degree of expert knowledge because it is difficult and you also need a really isolated site such as a desert or a non-disturbed area, uh, usually located in non-human locations. Uh, you need a large site too, so you can put a lot of pixels or big pixels onto that site. Uh, they usually are, are deserts or what they call pseudo-invariant calibration sites or PIX sites. There's a low number of these available sites, so that's, that's changing. But the methodology for how people use these sites and the way that you can use them or overuse or people overprescribe them is inconsistent, which is leading to a lot of inability to translate between different sensors, uh, or at least a lot of work to translate between different sensors. And then if you're actually going to run a real field campaign, uh, besides being arduous and isolated, generally these are pretty expensive and only the national space agencies and other government assets have, have been able to ascribe the high costs to those that they need. So because the data calibration is inconsistent, um, there is a problem with data harmonization, uh, sensor to sensor mismatch within a constellation, space to airborne mismatch. Two ways to look at that. One is even if you have multiple satellites up there and they're theoretically identical satellites, it's hard to get those to match up correctly without good calibration. Um, and space to airborne, so going from uh, above the atmosphere to in the atmosphere uh, can be very problematic in terms of trying to get the calibrations right or at least the, the data to correlate uh, across platforms. The atmosphere is our number one issue, <laughs> necessary to sustain life on Earth, but not really great for calibration because it's very inconsistent and it's hard to measure in real time. Large area targets, uh, shown up here on the upper right, uh, are often um, used, uh, but sometimes misused uh, because they, you don't have enough pixels. For example, up here in this, this image, you can see that these, these are very large um, tarps, uh, but, uh, but do I have enough pixels there to make sure that that center pixel on each one of these is actually calibrated? Um, that's a question mark. There's, there could be some adjacency issues there. Some pixels bleeding into other pixels depending on the quality of the image of the satellite. Uh, which also leads us to, to uh, spatial aspects of, of things too. You, you want to look at not only radiometric calibration, which is what targets are used for, but you also want to look at spatial things. So you want edges, uh, such as here we show land to water. Uh, you can see that we want this red line really for an ideal kind of edge spread function analysis uh, or an ESF. Uh, and what we get is this uh, uh, blue line, which is really not uh, optimal for uh, determining uh, resolution, point spread function, MTF. Um, so they use roads and bridges and other man-made targets, uh, but again, you have to do a lot of statistics on that and a lot of analysis. So what we'd really like is we like something that actually gives us both uh, radiometric and geometric information in a single uh, event. So the classic methodologies that are applied to calibrations are natural inversion references, uh, such as deserts or uh, dry lake beds or other large, relatively uniform areas um, that uh, are observed by satellites. And in the process of that, uh, people are out on those areas uh, with uh, calibration equipment, measuring them and making sure that we understand what ground truth is or the, the, the absolute uh, radiance of those reflective surfaces. Um, but as they are large areas, uh, they are also influenced greatly by what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, that's not just the direct solar radiance, uh, this red here, but it's also the diffuse 
sky radiance, the clouds, uh, upper atmosphere aerosols, uh, smoke or haze in the atmosphere, um, and how long that atmosphere path actually is for the sun to go through the atmosphere. Our, our, our atmosphere is a non, is a spectrally uh, transmissive media, uh, and as such, um, how long that atmosphere is, what time of day, where the sun, is, where you are on the Earth, what uh, what time of year it is, all influence uh, these things, and they all need to be measured. And you can't be too close to things. So, so a lot of things influence the classic methodology. You have to have a perfect sky. Generally, you you need to be you need to have a team out there that's measuring all of these different rays that you see here to qualify all these things to really get to the right uh, level so uh, of, of absolute calibration so that that's why it, it is currently so difficult uh, the flare technology is based on a technique called the spark uh, the specular array calibration um, so instead of using a natural inversion surface which responds to any form of radiation coming at it from from the environment. Um, here we only care about one ray. We care about the direct solar path to the mirror because this is a specular mirror back up to the satellite. Um, we do care about the background, absolutely. Uh, it's a big, big part of the extraction is we need to understand the background very well. But, um, but for the most part, we now we don't care about uh, a lot of the other things. We could have clouds up here, and we really don't care as long as we have a clear path uh, to the satellite um, and from the sun. So um, this also has the secondary benefit that it is actually truly a point source. If we choose the right mirrors, then they are small enough that they are sub-pixel on the ground, and they appear as a point source. And from a point source, you can derive a lot of very useful information about the image quality and the sharpness of, of, of focus, uh, MTF, uh, a lot of other really, really valuable information. So we get the radiometry from the, the direct solar reflectance off the mirror, and we get our spatial information about the fact that this is actually a designed point source. So it also has, uh, uh, we don't use flat mirrors because if you just relayed the, the, the image of the sun to the satellite, you would saturate the satellite. Uh, the sun is very, very bright. So we want to relay some fractional aspect of the energy to the to the satellite. Uh, to do that, um, one way to do that is to use convex mirrors. Uh, the convex means it's curved upwards or it's bowed outwards. Uh, that, that curvature actually opens up a field of regard. So we have the we have the point source here, uh, which is the sun, uh, that is reflected off the mirror. But anywhere in this field of regard, this angular subtense, which is created by the curvature of the mirror, that if, if the satellite's passing through there, this all you see is the image of the sun, the point source itself. It, it's kind of like a, almost like relaying a, 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 an OAP and a, and a collimator, relaying the image of the sun back to the satellite. But now we have an angular field of regard. So anywhere in this field, uh, the satellite can see that. And that makes the tracking much easier. It does, it does two things for us. Uh, number one is it, it, it reduces the amount of energy coming from the sun because we are spreading that energy out over an angular subtense now. Um, so, so it acts like an ND filter. The second thing it does is it opens this field of regard, which uh, now allows us to uh, more easily target the satellite. We don't have to be exactly aimed at the satellite. We just have to know approximately where the satellite is within about a, a two to five degree field of regard. And we, the satellite will see us if it's pointing in, in our direction or a nadir pointing. So, um, so the, the curved mirror provides that. The third thing the curved mirror provides is that each one of these mirrors can be replicated. So basically, instead of using one mirror, we can use nine mirrors. So the amount of signal related to the satellite, uh, if these are all the same radius of curvature and all the same diameter, in this case is 1x, and in this case is 9x. So we have a completely linear scale of, of uh, mirrors that uh, by deploying the number of mirrors we can deploy exactly the amount of signal that we want to the satellite or optimize the signal to the satellite or even do a linearity check on the satellite by exposing multiple mirrors in multiple images. Um, <clears throat> now this all being said that's the mechanism of the optics. Um, the second thing we need is we need a radiometer to tell us what's going on. So uh, in the in the flare network uh, with the spark methodology we have to have some sort of a solar irradiance radiometer and that's going to do several things for us. It's going to one it's going to look at the sun 
and it's going to measure the direct radiance of the sun. Uh, and then we're going to trace, make that traceable back to some uh, instrument, uh, which is above the atmosphere. Usually, uh, usually we use the TSIS-1, uh, which is on the space station. It's a very, very accurate, sub 1% accuracy solar measurement. So we know what outside the atmosphere, what the sun is. Now we're measuring the sun through the atmosphere. So we can use those two things to extract atmospheric information and also get back to our top of atmosphere your solar radiance that, that is, can be projected back down through the atmosphere. Uh, this radiometer also can look at the mirrors and determine reflectance. It can look at the background and determine the background reflectance if, if those conditions are changing, say rain or dry. Now on the tower, we also have a camera that allows us to look at the sky. So, so between the radiometric tower and the tracking system for, for Flare's mirrors, uh, we have a complete system that we call Flare. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute with, with a video that shows you how that works. But I want to show some of the what of this what this looks like actually from the satellite. So th these uh, these images were taken with Iconos. This is a parking lot, um, and that has a number of flare systems deployed. There's some cars over here, but these are flares. Uh, uh, spark targets um, and there's you can see that there are different sizes uh, there's different numbers of mirrors some of them appear to be brighter to your eye and they are actually because we have different numbers of mirrors there uh, so here we're in the field of regard of the satellite but on the on the right here we are out of the field of regard so you can see that the mirrors have kind of this on off uh, quality to them, which could also be useful because we can very quickly turn them on or off or even pulse them by basically knocking the mirror out of the out of the field of regard by just shifting it a, a degree or two. Um, so that could have some implications for uh, say AC, this is a DC signal or if we turn them on and off we could create an AC signal or pulse them. Uh, so that's an interesting aspect of, of uh, Spark technology. But more to the point on the very far right here we have this uh, linear scale. So this is this is a number of these uh, spark targets taken here along this line and your eye can barely discern that there's actually a difference in brightness there but clearly we see here what we have is a multiplier effect which is based on the number of mirrors and, the, and that is directly correlated and spectrally independent of the number of mirrors that we use and it uh, is directly correlated to the amount of radiance seen by the satellite. So let's look at how the flare system actually works when it's in operation. So we need a few things here. We need solar radiance, we need atmospheric transmission, uh, we need the background, we need some mirror reflectance, and then uh, we, want to we want to track and relay the sun to the satellite. Uh, track the satellite and relay the sun to the satellite. And then we want to send all that data back to you through the cloud system. So this is what flare stations do. Uh, so I'll just play this little video here. Uh, this is this, we're measuring the sun. Uh, we get measured atmospheric transmission and solar radiance. We measure the mirror reflectance. We measure the surrounding reflectance. And then we use the, the, the sun and we relay that to the satellite using the tracking system and we track the satellite. We set, correlate all that information, send it back up to the cloud, uh, and then the customer can pull that down through the Flare portal. Uh, very simple, very easy to use, very powerful. Flare sites can also have multiple mirrors. This is a turret. Uh, this is a 3.5 meter turret that's capable of uh, calibrating things like Landsat and Sentinel, which have about 30 to 60 meter, uh, 10 to 60 meter GSDs, uh, ground sample distances. Um, so we have a number of mirrors here. Uh, each mirror is covered by uh, a uh, protective cover, which is uh, sealed. Um, and those covers can be addressed independently. Uh, so we can turn off, uh, we can turn on one mirror uh, by removing the cover, or we can turn on all mirrors by removing all the covers. And there are also different types of mirrors in each of these bays. So that allows us to serve uh, very large DSDs like Landsat, uh, to very small GSDs like a UAV, which would be sub-centimeter. We would have different mirror sets uh, for, for serving those different uh, flying items, but they can all be in one flare station. Um, so, or the other thing we can do is in sequence as where as a satellite is flying over us, uh, we can open uh, one mirror, five mirrors, 10 mirrors, 25 mirrors, uh, and basically create a linear scaling. If the satellite can point at us and we're, we're pointing at the satellite, then that satellite would be able to actually uh, capture multiple images at multiple signal levels and create uh, a linearity characterization or an empirical line method characterization that, that could be used to, do, to determine the satellite gain coefficients. 
So let me just play this little movie here just to show you how a, how a flare system actually looks on the ground. We showed it to you kind of uh, in profile, uh, what it's doing overall, but this is what the actual mirror station is doing. So first we open the mirrors up, the covers drop off, uh, then we find the sun, uh, and then we look for the satellite. Now here we are tracking and within the satellite field of regard, so we look like a point source. Uh, and then uh, we continue to track the satellite for a few seconds or a few minutes, depending on what we're doing. Um, but that enables them to take multiple images or us to open multiple mirrors for different uh, types of testing. Another way to think about flare is the way this looks and the way it looked in the, in the animation is we are a traceable, adjustable star on the ground, which is a throwback to some very well-established classic uh, star radiometry, which is done with space telescopes, uh, where they have the luxury of not having an atmosphere. We are a star on the ground with the world in the loop. Uh, we are able to, to do the atmospheric extraction and get those out using the same, exact same type of methodologies that are applied for star radiance calibrations and image quality verification. So we are a traceable, adjustable star on the ground. So I just want to show how uh, this can be used for different uh, uh, satellites and kind of what's going on in, in, in general perspective. Um, so we have a little video here showing our radiometric tower um, and what it looks like uh, out to our portal and then to our mirror station. So we have a satellite that wants to come over and we can do that. We'll send up, uh, we'll get an image of that system. And then maybe the next thing the customer wants to do is an airborne solution. So, so we'll uh, open up a different set of mirrors for the airborne. And then maybe they have a UAV. They're trying to get really high resolution data. So we'll open up a third set of mirrors to promote um, a, a UAV calibration. So different sizes of mirrors for different GSDs can handle all these different types of platforms. Uh, this is a, a short video uh, showing our alpha system. Uh, just to, we've been doing animations up to this point. Let us show you kind of real hardware. Uh, this is at our test site in uh, New Hampshire, our headquarters. Uh, you can see our radiometric tower opening up here. Um, it is normally stowed and then it opens up. Um, and then we go and we find the sun and we start doing our track uh, using the, the radiometer station. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, uh, or shortly thereafter, uh, we are opening the flare station. Uh, so its mirrors here are, their covers are dropped off and they are getting ready to find the sun. So we turn, we find the sun. Then uh, we turn and we start tracking the sun and the satellite together uh, to allow the calibration to actually occur. And then uh, we close everything up at the end. And just uh, something to point out here at the end, the mirrors do have a cleaning system on them, a pneumatic cleaning system, and they are hermetically sealed. So uh, basically they stay clean and critter free. Uh, bugs can't get in, uh, dust and so forth. Uh, the mirrors do have to be cleaned periodically, um, but that's about once every three to six months. We've had several of these systems out in the field for uh, over a year now and, and very little problem, e even when there's uh, rain, snow, or we've actually Actually lived through a, a mini tornado as well. So very robust systems designed for outdoor use. Uh, some other things that Flare can help with, and I'll go through these quickly. Uh, these are atmospheric and situational problems. Uh, we believe that we can help lower uncertainty uh, with Flare because we can deploy these where they need, where they are best utilized. Um, uh, the best place to put one actually is at high altitude because when you go to high altitude, uh, you notice you can't breathe anymore. That's because there's less atmosphere. Uh, less atmosphere means less atmospheric distortion. It means that we're getting uh, less uncertainty. The single largest uncertainty item in the flare uncertainty chain is the atmosphere. So by lowering the atmospheric burden, uh, we believe we can get ground truth at uh, probably a sub 2% level. We're, sub, we're about 3.5% right now, one sigma. We believe we can push that down to maybe as low as below 2% uh, using high altitude placements. Uh, we are getting an atmospheric extraction uh, or measuring atmospheric extinction, depending on which way you want to look at it. Uh, and that can be, that is a similar method to the AeroNet. 
um, that is currently out there today and one of the classic methodologies that's done, but we're actually doing this spectrally um, so we can derive a lot more information and perhaps enhance the aeronet methodology. We don't care about clouds. Uh, we do care if they're in our way, in our optical paths, uh, but Popcorn clouds or partially cloudy days do not really bother us. Um, so, because all we care about is the direct line of sight between the sun and the mirror and the mirror and the satellite. As long as we have those lines of sight, we're good. And mobility is really one of the transformational aspects we believe of this technology. Um, you can deploy this when or where they need. The, the system I've showed so far are large static systems. There are mobile modalities of flare that enable you to bring the system with you to a specific site or designation. They operate in the same way. They're just on a tripod rather than on a fixed station. So uh, being able to bring the calibration where you need it uh, and still have it function, uh, whether it be for airborne, space, uh, or, or uh, satellite, is a, a true a degree of freedom that is not existing today in, in current uh, methodologies. Um, and then because of the mobile, mobility, we can put them in unconventional locations. Um, for example, down at the equator, uh, very hard to find good calibration sites at the equator. Um, unless they're a desert, uh, but you know we really, you know, say like you're interested in tropical environments. Uh, really, not a lot of good options there for calibration sites. But you could bring a mobile flare station with you, and you could actually put it down on the equator and to look at uh, tropical rainforests uh, or coral health. Uh, you could even put these on the water as well. Um, so uh, bring them with you on the boat. And, and the slight motion of the boat doesn't affect the fact that these are still a point source because of the field of regard. So um, so then there are papers on this. There are papers on every single one of these. Spatial and spectral problems we can solve. Well, PSF and MTF are an obvious thing because we are actually giving you a point spread function um, and a, a target or target patterns that can be laid out. Uh, we can help with BRDF because we can, if you can track us and we can track you, then we look like a constant reference point source on the ground as your satellite flies over on an angular basis. Um, it, from an ag angular perspective, um, uh, the, the ground image might be changing because of BRDF or the apparent surface reflectance might be changing because of bidirectional reflectance distribution function and scattering function as a function of angle. Uh, the flare system is not. So if you have a flare in the reference of that scene, the BRDF of the, everything else in the scene can be tracked by referencing back to the constant flare signal. We can add polarization into the system. Um, so the mirrors don't have to be monolithic. We don't have to use the same coating on all the mirrors. We could use some that have polarized coatings or polarized surface, uh, surfaces. We have azimuthal and elevation control so we can control the direction of polarization. Um, and so it opens up a new chapter perhaps in uh, using, uh, having calibrated polarized stations by using this mirror technology. Uh, likewise, again, non-monolithic, uh, we can change the mirrors to have different coatings, so, but the ideal is, is that the, 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 the amalgam of the mirrors is still sub-pixel, so to all, for all intents and purposes, e each mirror could have its own band coating, and then what, what, what the satellite sees is it sees one signal that is a convolvement of all of those independent bands uh, combined together. Um, and then also we've done some work in the mid-wave infrared. These are aluminum mirrors and they still have reflectivity out into the mid-wave infrared, which is very good, but uh, there isn't a lot of solar signal to work with out there. So you have to, you have to pick and choose your battles when you get to the mid-wave infrared. Uh, and then finally, uh, we can create defined target layouts that allow us to basically do some fingerprinting of satellites. Um, if we can lay down specific patterns that we know very accurately, then that can tell us something about the optical transformation that, that the telescope or the optics of the, of the imaging system are actually performing on the image and get us to some very fundamental uh, uh, Raleigh criteria or perhaps even Zernike kernels on the optical uh, transform of that satellite and and uh, that could be very interesting in terms of determining a, a kind of a, a virtual fingerprint of satellites and, and preventing people from messing with the imagery or being able to identify that satellite uniquely uh, from that optical signature. The whole object of FLARE is to enable all analysis-ready data, to improve radiometri radiometry, make it easy to get, uh, to improve geometry, make it allow them to register the image, 
uh, to the planet. Uh, I forgot to mention up to this point that uh, flare stations are ground control points as well. So you have the optical signature, but you also know exactly where that is to less than a centimeter. And there are multiple ground control points, uh, GCPs on the flare systems. So uh, when you're doing your optical uh, measurement, you're also getting a geodetic reference point. Um, that you can use to rectify your images. So that's a, a very valuable. Um, all of this uh, between getting the radiometry and the geometry right actually allows us to put together a really good metadata file um, that allows your users to take your data with, with less arduous uh, in uptake and you get to the data that they want. What everybody's after here is data. They're not after the image, they're after the data that the that can be derived out of the image um, so uh, we want we want to make that easier to do and then also if you have a constellation or multiple satellites in your network or multiple uh, sensors in your network of different types or the, uh, the same types uh, flare can be used for all of those things to unify them so that so that it looks like one sensor the objective with most satellite constellations is to have it look like one giant sensor even though it's many small sensors where we're trying to harmonize all the images together. So we want that interoperability, that, that good calibration and good geometry allow us. And then that allows the customers to really get to what they want, which is what it's all about at the end of the day. So, um, so just to show you visually uh, kind of how that plays out, uh, satellite A, B, and C could all reference different flare sites around the world, uh, take different uh, image tiles of those flare sites, then we can extract from each one of those the point spread functions and, and get spatial harmonization and ground control points and make sure everything is rectified properly, and then uh, add the radiometric harmonization as well if there, if there was radiometry available there. Uh, same tiles allow us to break it into the multispectral, hyperspectral aspect of those sensors and to, uh, to do the intercomparison between the satellites uh, with the flare signal being the constant reference point in all of those frames. We can tile those images, uh, combine their radiometric response, um, get them all at the same base level, combine and make sure we adjust for any spatial issues associated with the, with the scenes. Then we can ultimately create the fused data product that derives the images that, that, and the data that customers really want. So Flare allows you to really unlock the value of ARD, analysis ready data, uh, go right to surface reflectance uh, with what we do by taking the atmosphere out of the equation. Uh, the sensor has known signals and, and can help with BRDF, uh, provide a stable traceable reference for any GSD or field of view um, and a ground control point. Uh, harmonize between your different sensors or different, uh, different assets. Uh, and then ultimately, once we get that kind of baseline, then we can start to look at time series or change detection um, with the system by setting up monitoring schemes, uh, using the flare as a constant reference point, um, and getting to diagnostics and monitoring if something's going wrong with the satellite, maybe some thermal conditions or something on the satellite, we can, we can actually see that, so we can help you choose that. And then ultimately, we get all this right. Everybody's um, on about machine learning and AI, uh, artificial intelligence, ML and AI, uh, which are fantastic and, and transformational tools in and of themselves. But if you don't get the data right, <laughs> then your your efficiency of your ML and your AI is less optimal in terms of the data it produces. If you can get the calibration right, then the ML and the AI are a lot more efficient and deliver a lot deeper, more insightful data. So so uh, we, we view this the ML AI as, as being optimized by the, the calibration and, and analysis ready data. Our mission is to provide interoperable calibration for in-flight electro-optic sensors every mission, every day. We want to make that really easy to do. Uh, we want to make it demandable, meaning you do it when you need it uh, and you pay for it when only what you need um, and really uh, derive uh, higher frequency and, and really increase the data value uh, to the customers who want to use the satellite data for what the insights they're looking for. If you have any more questions, contact Labster Incorporated at 603-927-4266 or email me, cdurrell at labster.com, Chris Durrell, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have.